The New York Public Library's main branch on 5th Avenue and 42nd Street in Manhattan. Its collections provide researchers access to books, electronic resources, manuscripts, photographs, prints, all sorts of materials, many of which are difficult or impossible to get anywhere else. The library's collections grow nearly every day with acquisitions of materials both new and old. Let's take a look at some new accessions. I'm Charles Kuykendall Carter, Assistant Curator of the Forzheimer Collection, and I'm going to show you some of the Forzheimer Collection's new accessions. We don't know who S. Mitchell was, but we can guess that she was the original recipient of this little square-shaped envelope and the special letter inside. The blues and pinks of the marbled paper have grown somewhat dull through time and exposure to dust, but for over 200 years, it's kept its contents nearly pristine. It's a fine early 19th century British example of what would later come to be called a puzzle purse valentine. A handmade, decorated manuscript love letter with a message that progresses as it unfolds. This one begins, Dear love, this heart which ye behold will break when you this leaf unfold. And of course the heart does literally break apart from the unfolding, as a second layer of the valentine is exposed. And when the valentine is completely unfolded, the innermost heart is revealed, along with the final part of the verse which ends, but never will my mind have ease till our two hearts are linked like these. The valentine isn't signed or dated, but the paper bears a watermark date of 1806, the year of its manufacture. We find it's unusual in this period for paper to be used more than a few years after the watermark date. Watermarks in paper are one of the best ways to pin down an approximate date for printed works, too, when they don't grant us the courtesy of carrying their publication date right on the title page. The publisher of Sarah Scudgell Wilkinson's Turtle Dove, a guide to writing Valentine messages, called it an original Valentine writer for the present year, though he neglected to put a date anywhere in the book. He likely suspected that he'd have leftover copies of the turtle dove to sell for future Valentine's Days and didn't want an expired date spoiling a sale. But the watermark date is 1809. At this time, Sarah Scudgell Wilkinson, most remembered for her gothic novellas, was a single mother operating her own business, a subscription library. For a small price, you probably could have borrowed the turtle dove from her shop at number two Smith Street in what today is London's upscale Chelsea neighborhood. The turtle dove provides example poetical messages and responses which range from flowery and earnest to pithy and wry. One of my favorites is a laconic valentine. My fair I love if you approve I'm ready to be thine, but if not, no harm is done, my gentle valentine. These two handbills tell news of a terrible tragedy that happened near Huddersfield, England in the early morning hours of Valentine's Day, 1818. The Colnbridge cotton mill caught fire and caused the deaths of 17 girls, ages 9 to 18, who had been working in the mill during the night. The handbills were printed by a jobbing printer in Nottingham 
named Charles Sambroke Ordoino. He would have had to work fast to get the handbills printed and sold while public interest in the horrid details of the story was still high. Haste is probably partly to blame for the typos. Twelve lines of nearly identical text appear in both handbills, and when we digitally overlay one on top of the other, we can see that they were printed from the same typesetting. Both handbills claim to quote directly from newspapers, but a search in the British Library's newspaper database shows us that only one of them actually does. The other one presents a dramatized version of the events, with a lot more adjectives and exclamation points. Why Ordoino printed two versions of the news story isn't clear. In Huddersfield, a monument stands in memory of the fire's 17 young victims, and as a reminder of the uncertainty of life and the vanity of human attainments. But the deaths of the Colnbridge Cotton Mill children were not entirely in vain. The news story was a national tragedy, and soon led to the first act of Parliament regulating the hours and working conditions for child factory workers. <laughs> 